Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at lionroxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another live stream episode of In the Trenches. Uh, I am your host, Ryan Roxy. What is happening today, folks? We will let you filter into the chat room on the Ryan Roxy official YouTube channel. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, and when you do do that, hit that subscribe button. You know the drill by now, folks. We're having a good one today. I'm telling you, I'm excited. You know when I get guitar players on the podcast in my step and um, i've worked a little bit more on the lighting today i think more than i've ever worked on any photo shoot <laughs> before so uh let's see what happens but let me uh give you a little heads up on our guest today because he's um one of the guys that i consider in the circle on the circle of, of when i was in the trenches working the way up working my way up he was doing the same and um, i did the math We've known each other for almost 40 years now. And we've been in this, running in the same sort of orbit for the past 40 years. He's been in a lot of bands, um, and which I found out doing the research for this podcast today. And you're going to hear about a lot of them. Um, but he's got a new band out, and we want to talk about that new album. Plus, he is the lead guitar player of L.A. Guns. So who else could I bring on of the lead guitar player of L.A. Guns Tracy Guns, welcome to In the Trenches. Hello, Tracy. <laughs> bravo, bravo. Completely non-scripted at all. It's all non-scripted. <laughs> no, What's I've, happening? I've, I think I've known you um, longer than any other musician in L.A. I did the math, and I was yeah. thinking about this. It's got to be the early 80s or right around the early mid-80s because now – this is what we're going to start the show off like on all gears because Vic, our producer, you know, he likes to run things like, like, like we're a freight train and usually we kind of go off the tracks, but right. to start the show, this is how we start the show. We go back to get forward and that's what we're doing. Right. What do you say, Vic? We sampled Gilby Clark's uh, motorcycle. for that. Oh, Perfect. <laughs> Are you a motorcycle guy? I, I don't remember I, back in the day. I used to be. You know, I was. And oddly enough, um, I always wore a helmet when I was a, a motorcycle guy. And then when the helmet law came in, I stopped being a motorcycle guy. Okay. I, 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 I don't know why. Um, but yeah, my last bike, I had 76 FXE or something. And the clutch pin kept breaking in the worst Okay, well, there you go. Um, you need a motorcycle. Right, right out of the gate, Vic likes to establish his territory as one of the best producers around, and he's got all these photos. So you're going to see some photos and some comments uh, right. coming up on the whole time on the show. And thank you very much, folks, for uh, filing into our uh, uh, Ryan Roxy official YouTube channel. That's where all the... Um, that's where all our comments can come up. And if you are listening to us on an audio broadcast, we appreciate that. But you want to see this guy. You want to see Tracy Guns today in full Technicolor. <laughs> yeah, I'm so <laughs> gorgeous. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about those uh, almost 40 years ago when we were a little bit more gorgeous. We're we gorgeous were now. But we're we, even, were we were, boy, were we cute. Yeah. Vic, do you have any pictures of, of, of Tracy and I back 40 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> man Let, but let's talk about um let's talk about maybe the first time i ever saw you and i'm not sure if you remember this or if you were there around there there's a rehearsal studio on highland and selma yeah 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 and so you know legend has it that you and uh you first started la guns with axel and then, mm -hmm. then Axel wasn't in the band, but then you guys decided to form uh, a band together and you called it Guns and Roses, you know, <laughs> Guns and Roses. Close enough. And dude, it's 40 years. I never put two and two together. Wait, is that you or me, Tracy? 
<laughs> we had the same haircut. <laughs> Holy crap! That was before the tattoos, so that could have been me Crazy, or you. Right? If you look, if you look under Axel's left hand, you can see like a little stream of the only tattoo I had. It's <laughs> like it's a rose. It's a tiny little rose. I love it. <clears throat> you had gotten it. a rose, and did he get a gun? He Go back didn't. to that picture real quick, just so you know. This is how how close we are uh, anatomically. Uh, I have yes. the same size nipples as you do, Tracy. Well, and, you got lucky, didn't we? <laughs> I just don't have a ring in mine now. I'm not sure if you have a ring in yours. And, no, I don't. And this is before the hair on the chest. So getting back to my story about this place on uh, Highland and Selma or McCadden, I think it was r and Studios. Did you practice there in that lineup ever? No. Um, okay. The only time that we were ever there is when we were auditioning. LA Guns was auditioning singers later. You know, um, Guns N' Roses and the early LA Guns with Axel, we rehearsed behind Guitar Center on Sunset. We had our own uh, kind of big room. We kind of sort of lived there. We kind of did everything there. And uh, the, the landlord, this guy, Billy, was so cool. Like he was an older straight fella and he just loved the drama. Like, like no matter how much drama was created there, this guy was like, it's all right, guys, don't worry about it. You're like, okay. <laughs> you know, he kind of allowed it to happen. Wow. Well then you got to thank him for it. But yeah. then I thought about it and this is where I didn't put two and two together until 40 years later, because you had named that band guns and Rose and then became Guns N' Roses, right. you will forever alter the rock and roll history with your name being right. that part of that name. That's because true. they could have actually, you know, changed it at one point to Stradlin' Roses. Whatever. You know, I thought about that. Or when, when Slash came in, it could have been Slash and Roses. Yeah. Like Slash and Roses. And that almost sounds like a heavier band than what right. know, it ended up being. Yeah, so, I never even thought about Slash and Roses. That would be a pretty good. Maybe I'll name my next band Slash and Roses. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, like I said, it took 40 years for me to figure out that your name and yeah. Rose, you know, oh, it's like, oh, wait, Tracy Guns, Axel Rose, Guns and oh, oh, I get it now. And now it's like history forever. And um, now you have two That's bands fun. that have your name in it. That's and, right. Um, That's right. And there's always some sort of controversy with the name, but we're going to get to that in a little bit later, okay. you know, because we're still going back to get forward now. Because I think the, I remember the first time seeing you live for me was at this uh, show at the Roxy where LA Guns opened up for, I think, I actually think Guns N' Roses opened up for LA Guns at the Roxy. And my whole band, which was Gilby at the time and Jonathan mm -hmm. and John Schubert Candy we all came to see you at that show. Do you remember that show at the Roxy? Yeah, that that was a long time ago, man. Wow. Um, yeah, there was some weird kind of billing, you know, sometimes where where we would both end up on the same show. Not not too many times, but that was I think we did once at the Whiskey, and then there was like we headline at that Roxy show, but then later, like a few months later. Guns N' Roses was headlining uh, Perkins Palace, right. and and we opened there, and then they were off to the races. You know, it was yeah. Then then things kind of took off for them, but then then yeah. we all sort of rode the coattails, right. and you and you guys being that L.A. Guns was was right behind there. You were right neck and neck in the race. Yeah. I remember, you know, there was a lot of times um, at that point where it would be um, it would be Guns N' Roses, L.A. Guns faster pussycat right and then you know a little bit down the the list would be electric angels which was the band i was in at that point you know okay. so and and by the time we could we been passed on by every la label that's when we moved to new york and stuff well i have a photo of me playing with you guys when you were still candy at the whiskey Okay. Okay. Was yeah. it one of those one of those guest sort of trash shows where we did the international set list of probably surrender or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Because I think, if I'm not mistaken, you know, Gilby kind of pulled me aside. I have the picture. It's on my wall downstairs. It's like <laughs> somebody blew it up. It's awesome. Um, it was a last minute thing. You know, Gilby's like, 
hey, you know, rock and roll all night or something, some simple kiss song. I'm like, no. And he's like, it goes like this, you know, like right before you guys went on, like show me like the chords really quick. And I went up there and, but I don't think that was the first time I, I met you, but that was definitely the first time we were all like the circle was starting, you know, it was like. Exactly. <sighs> I think that same show, didn't the guys in Jet Boy come up on stage as well? We might have had these, I think we had these pink and black screens at that That's point. Right. Which we, we thought we were so ahead of our times and maybe we were because yeah. we were using these screens because we didn't want to bring, I think Gilly wanted to bring just like a small deluxe amp that he loved that sound. Yeah. And it didn't, it didn't look as massive as the, uh, you know, you always, you guys, especially with LA guns, you always had amazing equipment setups. It was always, oh, I, love it here. I want that rig exactly like I'm looking at right now. Oh. Here I am. We've moved studios by the way, but I'm looking at your place right now going, look at all those classic amps. Is this your, is this your, man this cave or this is, is why i make all the records you know in this old garage and uh you know but the thing is is like all this cool stuff is like i don't use it anymore you know uh i mean live sometimes i pull out you know the big marshals and, and all that stuff but not very often so now it's just kind of like decorations and i don't really record with this stuff that much anymore Everything goes back to, you know, everything is so much more digital these days. And I know that you have a few companies that you're working with right now, as do I. So we're going to talk about that equipment's just a little bit down the road. Okay. I'm like, I, I like, I want people to get ca caught up with the history that we have. Yeah, of course. The 40-year history. If you, because that, that, that lineup that I saw at the Roxy, I, I really like that lineup. I think Paul was singing at that point. Yeah. Um, Robert Stoddard. Yeah, you and you had who was the drummer? It was Nikki playing Nikki. drums. I, yeah, yeah, beat. and it was killer. Nikki, Nikki beat, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking hell. So, and I remember that whole lineup, and then, um, and then, then I remember there was a time where Phil Lewis came, and then all of a sudden, you guys reinvented yourselves. That's right, that's right, you know, because. That kind of original band with Paul Black and uh, Robert Stoddard was really. I thought it was a super cool band because at the time, you know, Mick and I were kind of the, you know, the brainchild. The Mick was still playing bass at that point, right? You That's know, right. so, but we had talked about this amalgamation of, you know, this kind of British garage rock, not so much American garage rock, but like these bands that were kind of happening in the late seventies, early eighties, while he, while Mick was still living in England. Like a uh, new wave of British heavy metal kind of stuff, or what? no, like the opposite, like like okay. like like the new wave of crappy trash music, <laughs> you know, uh, like girl, <laughs> like, like girl, like the babysitters, uh, stuff like that, and those kind of bands kind of evolved um, to where we have like you know the backyard babies and the helicopters, you know, now or you know in the past, that was that kind of scene that Mick was really into, and I was really into you know, Scorpions and Randy Rhodes and, you know, stuff like that. So we decided, you know, we were like, hey, can we mix these two vibes together? And I thought that original band with Paul Black and Robert Stoddard really kind of did that. that Our vibe, songs yeah. were trashy, but yeah. then I could play like, you know, neoclassical guitar solos, you know, <laughs> of, so it, it was fun, but then when things got serious, things flipped more towards metal. You know, a little yeah. less trash, a little bit more more metal, a little bit more current songwriting style and stuff like that. And we got Phil, and you know, everything worked out. Obviously, so you know, yeah. No well, Phil out. has to, Phil has such a great attitude, such a great voice, and he fit right in. I, yeah. I'm thinking the common denominator of that first lineup and the second lineup, though, and it does have a little bit of punk rock and rock that that, that has this mainstay through metal. It was the leather yeah. jacket that you would wear. You would wear just a leather jacket, no yeah. shirt, and you know we'd all wear leather jackets. I think we all had the same yeah. kind of leather. Wilson. <laughs> Wilson House of Leather. Do you That's remember it. that? We all had it. Nikki Six had it, so we all had it. <laughs> and we and we probably bought our spandex maybe a couple of years before at uh, Fredericks of Hollywood. Frederick. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> now at that point, because I had read an article uh, that you were about those early early days, 
when you know right after LA Guns and Guns N' Roses be, you know split came back together became two different bands you were not living in Hollywood you were living in Covina or was did mm-hmm. did you quickly move to uh Hollywood or did you ever live in Hollywood yeah i've always lived in Hollywood um and basically in this house that i still live in um this is my grandparents house and um so when I was going out with this girl and she lived in Covina with her parents. So we kind of just lived there, lived here back and forth kind of a thing. And that was different than living in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you had to drive and go through traffic and stuff oh, like that. Man. Yeah. I was, you know, I was 18. I was, I was exactly 18 years old that year. It's so strange, dude, because I always thought, and I think it's because you had the success of LA guns and I was in this sort of, I was just getting into town and trying to find my place in it. And, you know, luckily getting in with candy, but then starting from scratch with electric angels Mm -hmm. because of the success of LA guns, I always thought you were older. And when when I did the damn math, I'm older than you. Yeah. I was really young, man. Son, Well, I mean, we're very close. I think we're the same. We're within months apart. You know, yeah. I think you were born in January. I was born in December. So we're like maybe two months apart of that. So Perfect. that means the, the high school days were basically the same for us. And I yeah. moved down in 83, right when I got out of high school. And I, I, and it, I know that you went to uh, Fairfax High, right? Yeah, I went to Fairfax High. Now, obviously, Slash went to Fairfax. I remember that. Lenny Kravitz mm-hmm. went to Fairfax. Do you remember those two or any of the Chili Peppers? Or did you hang out with any of those dudes? Yeah, well, actually, Lenny went to Beverly Hills High School. and uh-huh. um, But Slash and I, we started going to school together in junior high school in seventh grade. You know, so we were, you know, these guys walking to school every day talking about Ted Nugent and Joe Perry and Jimmy Page and then <laughs> Van Halen happened. So that's that's where we come from. But at Fairfax, yeah, you know, the Chili Peppers were a little bit older than us. So right. um, we kind of knew them. They kind of knew us, but they were established already. Like they were like a high school band. You know, they were called Anthem. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but there were there was like so many actors and things that went to Fairfax High School that like later, you know, you you, you exit high school. And you're like, see people on TV and in movies and stuff, you know, and you're Do you like, hey, some of the names. Do you remember some of those names? I, I don't now. Wow, were you class of '83 as well? Okay, there it is. There it is. Vic has found your yearbook. I can't. No, I would have been, but I, I I took the GED in '82. You got the get out of jail free card. I love I it. Did. Huh? I did, and I got my diploma. Okay, so yeah. you would have been class of '83, and but you got out early. Exactly. Okay, because you know it is funny how you say that. Uh, you know you don't see the guys in chili peppers even though they went to the same high school i get the same thing with the guys in jellyfish because right. they went to the high school that was my rival high school the same years maybe a year or two uh, ahead but right. i never saw them growing up in pleasanton right. so it wasn't those things and even though their our high schools were like really close together and stuff well, kind of like hollywood high school and um fairfax high school you know really exactly. close and you know you would run into especially when I was younger, like when I was 15, 16, you know, playing Gazaris and stuff, um, there would be bands playing at those Battle of the Bands that were from Hollywood High School that were really good <clears throat> and be like, whoa, you know, where are you guys from? Well, we go to Hollywood High School. Be like, oh, okay. And mm-hmm. and the bands that were going to Hollywood High School were really good metal bands, like, you know, kind of like, you know, along the lines of Scorpions and very, very tight very good sounding bands, you know, so it was, it was a cool thing, but there was never a rivalry, uh, unfortunately between the high schools. Cause that would have been interesting. Do you think there was a rivalry between all the guys that were LA guitar players? Uh, for instance, you and slash versus guys like me that came down to Hollywood and joined up with GIT. Right. Think, was there a, st- was there a stigma because I honestly think that you uh, might have more classically trained, you, you know, 
or did you learn your you, did you learn guitar through you know self taught or were you going to private lessons and what was the vibe like with you know like what are these guys from GIT doing? Well, it was it was interesting as years went on. You know, I'm self taught. You know, and then later, you know, like after our third LA Guns record, I went to Valley College and took some music courses. Um, and then I've been I still study, um, but. Back then, um, when GIT really became a thing and students were populating Hollywood Boulevard and all that stuff, um, it was really interesting to me because I, you know, I had met certain people that had been through the course, you know, and were really, really good. And there was no real difference other than guys that went to GIT understood what you could do with the guitar, the possibilities, you know. Uh, you know, how modes work, for instance, you know, things like that, that, you know, when you're self-taught, you know, you, you find a pentatonic scale and you beat the shit out of it for the rest of your life. You know, that's basically still doing that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm a teacher now. So, I mean, I, I know what everybody wants on different levels and, and what it is. And the GIT guys, um, <clears throat> they had it all. Um, but at the end of the day, as you know, the thing that sells a guitar player is the person. You know what I mean? So yeah, you could be this technical shredder. And if you have a great personality, well, you're awesome. You know, right. if you're a shitty guitar player, but you have a great personality, you're awesome. You know, but if you don't have personality and there's nothing exciting about you playing any instrument, then people really don't, they don't care. You know what I mean? It's, it's more at the end of the day, you know, people always, you know, you get the question, you know, who's better, you know, who's, who's the greatest guitar player of all time? Well, Keith Richards is because he wrote Start Me Up. He made more money off that riff than any other guitarist in history. So, right. it, it you know, technically is one thing, and then professional guitaring is another thing. You know, if you're a professional, it means you want to make money, you know. Right. So Keith Richards wins, then Angus Young wins, you know. But we all know, that, of course, that Eddie Van Halen is the – greatest guitar player of course you know but definitely we we come from sort of the the exact same record collection you know we come from that school and i was thinking about it this morning because i've i've actually really really fallen in love with the uh, with the wolfgang songs that he's putting out everything that he's put out so far yeah. i've really been blown away with and i mean god i mean just watching that the video with you know him and his father all the early footage it's a, it's such a tearjerker i was like literally crying this morning I with my wife yeah. she's just like it's a, but it's a good song too and i yeah. looked at it and i looked at all those footage and i was going that's the one of the reasons i don't have any tattoos because eddie van halen didn't have tattoos he might have had one or you know he might have had that little i'll tell you a story one. really quick i used to play golf with eddie and there's a joke in there somewhere and i'll tell you later and <laughs> I got this killing machine tattoo on my leg right here, which is this weird KM logo. And I was wearing shorts that day. And he goes, why'd you get the MTV logo tattooed on your leg? And I go, I go, it's, it's not MTV. It's that, that band I'm doing right now. Killing machine. He goes, he goes, see, you're only going to be in that band for like six months and you're going to have that tattoo for the rest of your life. Tattoos are stupid. You should get something that means something. And I go, yeah, well, you know, I'll always remember the band. Right. So, Within six months, he got this Amsterdam tattoo on his arm somewhere, you know, and I, I never I never got to give him shit about the tattoo. But, yeah, he did. He had one tattoo and I believe it's just at Amsterdam. Wow. That's the that's the one guitar hero. One of my biggest guitar oh. heroes that, that I never met. And, and oh. I, I and, and one of those things I was I was reticent about meeting him because I had heard such crazy stories that if you weren't on that level of yeah. Eddie, then it might not be the same experiences as you were. Mm -hmm. So obviously you had that respect from Eddie and it was you know, weird. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I'll, I'll be honest about it. You know, he, he had heard a live uh, uh, King biscuit flower hour, LA guns recording on the radio. And he called the engineer of the Westwood one truck, this guy Biff, and said, hey, how did you guys get that guitar to do that? 
because of what it was, was there was, it sounded like there was two guitars going at the same time, but I used a chorus pedal on one side and it was dry on the other side. So it gives it this wobble. Yeah. So anyways. It's a Satriani trick. It's a, it's a little bit of a Joe Satriani thing. I like it. Right. But it was definitely, for me, it was a Randy thing for sure. Okay. Right. So I get home one day, I'm probably 24, 25. Eddie Van Halen's on my answer saying, Hey, yeah, Tracy, you know, it's, it's Eddie, Eddie Van Halen. Uh, could you call me? I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. You know, like, Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, that's a big like, one. Hey, you know, this is Tracy. Yeah. Hey, could you come up here? I'm like, up where? <laughs> you know, like what's going on? And they were mixing, um, the live record with Sammy Hagar. It was a Van Halen record live thing. And Eddie was trying to mix it himself with an engineer called me up there and he played me the thing. He goes, how did you do that? And I said, and, and the truth was that the chorus track was distorted and we didn't use it. And what we had to do is we had to take my main guitar track re-record it on another track. And then we had a harmonizer because we didn't have a, a, you know, a chorus pedal in the, in the Westwood one truck, you know what I mean? It's like, what do we have where we can alter this other guitar? So that's how I met Eddie Van Halen. You know, it was like, right story. whoa, you know, but uh, yeah, he liked everybody, dude. He, yeah. he was, I, I really actually cool. think I would have had a good conversation with him. I just, you know, I just, it never happened. The closest I got was uh, seeing the, rehearsal the final rehearsal for the 1984 uh tour really you know at zoa troop studios uh in like a big airplane type hangar type you know film studio thing at zoa troop wow. some, somewhere in hollywood it was like me and like 50 other people and that was Amazing. it so that, yeah so that was like the closest i got so i felt like i sort of okay this is my moment with eddie and it was the first time i'd ever really seen him play keyboards and i was like whoa dude i want you to play guitar but obviously i see you're going for another you're going up another level you know well he was smart you know we he realized early on that in order to be eddie van halen or in order to be jimmy page or in order to be randy rhodes for that matter it's up to David Lee Roth and Robert Plant and the songs, right? You know, the only way you can deliver your genius is through the vocal and the song, you know, and Eddie Van Halen always stressed that, you know, no matter what, that, that song was always the delivery system for the music, um, which gets lost in, in so many people that, you know, that, you know, hey man, it's just all about the guitar, and it's really not because the guitar has to has to play against something. You know what I mean? It has to be uh, a, a decoration almost. You know, I mean, you have a main riff, and then you write a big chorus over it, and, and, and some meaningful lyrics, and then the solo and, and the fills. Those are the decorations. You know, but without that song. All you have is decorations. It's kind of like having a box of, of Christmas ornaments without the tree, exactly. you know, and that's really where he came from. And he always understood that. So, you know, the genius lies within realizing that, Hey, I got this wild man singer, great lyrics, great, great riffs. Now I can decorate this. And that's the delivery system, you know? And, and, you know, I remember when, he they switched to uh Sammy Hagar. You know, a lot of people were like, Whoa, you know, Sam, why he Sammy Hagar? Yeah. You know, that, yeah. That's weird. Well, Eddie's smart, you know. You know, at that time, I think you know, uh Sammy Hagar was at least on par with Van Halen, you know, in a pop rock sense, you know, and then then you know, Eddie with writing, you know, on a keyboard and things like that. You know, he wanted to sell records, you know, he wanted to 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 be included with the biggest artists of all time, you know, and the only way to do that is through songs, you know, I mean, it's back to the Rolling Stones, start me up, you know, ain't talking about love, this, that, and the other, you know, songs are important. Growing up. Yeah. Growing up in the, in the Bay area, I was such a huge Sammy Hagar fan. 
Right. And I was just a big Van Halen fan. I never was a Van Hagar fan, so to speak, right. but I understood it. And I understood, I, I've always said, I, I agree with you um, in your point, because I've always said that there's so many great guitar players out there, but the guitar heroes, mm. guitar heroes come from great bands with great songs. That's right. That's why they're guitar heroes, you know? Hold so, on, let me mute this. No worries. So, you know. Is that your is your microwave going off? Or are you getting just no? It's my my, my oldest son. He's taking a break from homeschooling and texting me right now. Oh, you know my my son does the same thing. <laughs> I've been doing the podcast now for over a year. I say Tuesdays at six p.m. Swedish time, and guess when he always calls me and texts me. <laughs> right at that Tuesday. <laughs> well, you said Tuesday at six, Dad. <laughs> See, I, I have a I have an 18 year old son now, Lennon. And wow. how old is your oldest son now? Twelve. Okay. So you got Lennon and I got Jagger. And then you know, I have a new one that's 14 months old named Oli. Congrats, man. And are they are they in uh Scandinavia? Are they in Denmark? Yeah, they're in Denmark right now. Okay. So you're yeah. you're back in the hood right now. This is uh you know, your sort of fun space. I we we did see it. Um I just saw you did a live thing um the other night and it was from there. Yeah. You did a live stream with Pete Thorne, yeah. who's been on the podcast before and it, it looked really great and you guys went through a lot of oh <laughs> it just it just you know he's here and like this whole house it's like layers of guitar shops, right? Like you, it's three stories and it's just like shunk, shunk, shunk. And he kept bringing things up. I'm like, oh, we got one of those, you know? Oh yeah, we, yeah, check this, you know? Uh, that was such a geeky, fun, like guitar party. I don't ever need to do one again. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, if, if you want a guitar geek out, we're going to geek, we're going to equipment geek out. I have a section, a little bit about equipment later. Okay, good. If, stories the stories right now i think are what mm -hmm. everybody in the chat is digging on they're enjoying this right now if you want to get into the technical stuff go obviously go check out pete thorne's uh podcast right. after this though after this yeah, because uh, we're sitting here with tracy guns right now talking um old school la um i want to talk about a bunch of the other bands that you've been in besides plus your current band sunbomb because i know that album just came out um but us being a little bit younger than the you know the motley crew era that's right did you feel back in those days did you ever have any contact with like you know randy Rhodes and in that in quiet riot and motley crew and wasp and those because they seem like the bands that was right before us and that's you right. were growing up in la were you mm -hmm. going to the troubadour to watch those shows mm -hmm. i was that that was what really turned me on to live music really was you know I used to go to the Troubadour on weekdays because it seemed safe, you know, and, and bands like White Sister and uh, this one really cool band called Wizard. And they were kind of like, you know, bands of the time, like you know, kind of maybe Rush influenced. And then White Sister was, you know, kind of this pre 80s rock band, you know, like like morphing from 70s rock into 80s rock. And then I saw an ad. Um, for Motley Crue at Pookie's in, in Pasadena. And I love the picture, but I couldn't go. I couldn't get to Pasadena. But then they played the Troubadour. And I went and saw them, and that was the end of my life. You know, I was like, whoa, you know, what the remember hell? what year that was? Did, was that the first album, or was that even before that? Way before, you know. So it was like they played all the songs that were the first album, for sure. Okay. You know, it opened would take me to the top, the whole deal, you know. But then I started seeing Wasp regularly and, you know, Rat I saw a couple times with Jakey e. Lee back then. And um, what were the other bands? I mean, it was all about Motley and Wasp really for me. Oh, yeah, Steven. But, yeah, I mean, I became friends with those guys because, you know, like we were saying earlier, you know, you and I were cute little kids kind of yeah, at yeah. that time, you know, and I had this like, you know, trying to be long hair. You know, I could never get my hair, you know, by the time I needed my hair to be long, we were already signed. You know what I mean? It was like, you know, I had this mid-length hair trying to do something forever. 
And I, um, I think it was a crimping iron that changed my life. It was either a crimping. That's it, it. it didn't. Have, it was before a straightening iron, but the crimping right. iron at first I had to make it work, and it was like crimpy. But yeah. then, then the, the straightening iron was a game changer for sure. But there was a couple other bands because we must have been in the same club because I used to go on the weekday nights as well. Uh, yeah. Rick Fox's Sin. I think yeah. that was I never one saw of them, them, but I, I know I know the band. And because uh, Rick Fox was the bassist, and um, he he was in a band called Steeler before with Ingve. That's right. That's so, right. On the first album, so I don't know if you ever saw any of that at the Troubadour, but I saw I saw the ads, and you know I, I was very big on image, you know, because I had seen Motley Crue, right. and I'm like, if a band didn't look like Motley Crue at that time, I mean, I was 15 or 16, then oh, shit. okay, so you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it was like death to false motley, <laughs> you know, kind of, kind of a mentality. I was 16 or 17 and Motley Crue played at Keystone Berkeley. Wow. Small club up in Northern California. It, it was about me and about maybe, maybe 75, a hundred people. It was like one Perfect. of those, you know, one of those club tours that we all know too well. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and even before that, you know, Nikki's band, which was a band called London, uh -huh. Now that's the that has been sort of the infamous thing of that London. If you wanted to be a musician in Los Angeles, you had to have played in the band London. But right. now they did change that. And all credit again, you get more historical credit. If you want to be a musician in LA, you have had to have played a gig in LA Guns. That's right. <laughs> that's right. I don't. Well, I think London spawned more stars, more legitimate. Uh, I don't know, man. You guys, you know. Timers. What are you talking about? Because you know, well, LA think about it. you know, Izzy was in London, and yeah. and Nikki was in London, and well, I guess that's it. <laughs> I guess those are the two. No, I, I remember. You're right, you know, London seems like this thing, but yeah. And if you go on the list, I mean, there is an actual Wikipedia list of LA mm -hmm. Guns members, members, and I know that you've been, you know, <laughs> the thing about the wiki thing says four stints when you've been in four stints of your own band then yeah. you know there's you're bound to be lots of members and there's one thing how many members do you think total because i actually did the math and i counted them up and i double checked it with vic yeah. how many members do you think total have been in la guns uh in all formations what do you think give it a number i would say 66 close it's Damn actually it. It was the, the actual count is 50, but I think you're probably right because I was going to say it's 50, but it's one more than 50 because I am not um, actually listed on your Wikipedia page. I hope someone does do that because I did play one gig in yeah. LA Guns at an Artist Worldwide show when uh, it was Phil's. LA Guns at that time yeah. and the, the guitarist that was playing or maybe it was you at that time. I don't know. Someone couldn't make it out to the gig. It was a baseball gig, a uh -huh. baseball field out way out in, you know, wow. East LA or, you know, just, just, just drive East and keep going. <laughs> <east. laughs> it was artists worldwide, you know, so you, just keep, you know, out in the Redlands. So I played one gig with LA Guns. So I was going to say one more than 50, but, you're yeah. probably right. There's probably more people that have been in between there, but that's yeah, a, I mean, hell of a lot of musicians. Yeah, th there is. And, and, you know, but there's only, it's, a, it's, it's hard to look at the band because the band's strange, right? If you look at the albums, even including the albums that I didn't play on, there's probably less than 25. Right. But then you look at, at the live performance side, and that's where you get a lot of, you know, other names that come in, you know, because uh, it, it's just, anyways, I, I don't pay that much attention. I'm not positive. <laughs> do you have an LA guns tattoo somewhere on your, I do your not because I didn't ever, because I knew that, that that's kind of the jinx, right? That's kind they'd of the be jinx. thinking that they'd be expecting that. <laughs> right. Yeah. They, it's like, it's like no LA guns tattoo. You're the illustrated man, and you don't have one LA Guns. That's that's a very interesting fact. But you do have one that you mentioned earlier of um, Killing that, Machine from Killing Machine, and that was right. that's that's one of your uh, solo projects that you've done. Right, right. That was a long time ago. That was like 
93, I think, you know, so mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, the years just keep going, man. <laughs> and there was a, and, and through the years, getting back to that point of, you know, passing of the guard and passing of the torch of rock and roll, you did end up playing with those guys in, you know, with Nikki from Motley yeah. because you ended up playing in a band called Brides of Destruction. Right. And we actually toured together yeah, for a did. very short time, but we did it. We, yeah. we did a tour together. Now, uh, now looking back on those years, do you, can you look back on, on brides as a, as a great experience, weird oh, experience? Great experience. Okay. Just, you know, that's the thing about um, being in a band or being part of something. And now with the internet, you know, you have this like, heavy manipulation of perceptions and, and things. And, you know, what do you believe? What do you not believe? But everybody I've ever played with in any concept, form, shape, club, arena, studio, garage, you know, uh, phone booth, whatever it is, it's always a great experience, you know, cause you're playing music with somebody that you respect. Like there's Michael DeBar and Slim Jim Phantom, you know, I mean, and you did that for after I left for a long time. You know, I'm going mean? to get to that point that 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 is uh, like you don't have an LA Guns tattoo. I don't believe that you and I have ever played in a band together, and I've tried to figure it out, like why we didn't, and was it at that point was our egos too big as guitar players to ever play together during those years? Because I think, you know, like whatever. You know, those 80s were a lot of testosterone. Right. You know, there's, there's no doubt. There's oh, a lot yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, you know, now that we're, you know, less immature, um, you know, you look back and, and you brought this question up earlier, but we didn't, we didn't cover it is like, was there this rivalry? And it's like, yes, during the cat house years, everybody pretended to like everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody's like, yeah, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you're it saying- was that, talking time in history. Yeah, there was a camaraderie that, that I felt, there was genuine was. camaraderie, but was. there was definitely like, you know, looking, going to the shows to see like, what does this guy got that I right. can maybe, you know, put into my show or put into right. our band show what can what can our what are the what's this band doing that we can either borrow from or do something completely different because they already got the market on that mm. um i'll tell you one thing that i never did and i think it might have been because you were so good at it and i was like not gonna even go there was the theremin yeah <laughs> Jimmy Page. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, you got it because obviously Jimmy Page was your guy, and you did. But then yeah. you actually took it and you made it part of your show. And, and yeah, and I was like, "There's no right now." Tracy, you know, he's got the theremin. You, we can. We, there's still an open like you know. Slash was sort of ruling on the on the wah wah pedal. Yeah, you know, you know he really. Good time. Yeah. There is there is an art to playing the Wawa. Have have you ever gotten that art of the of the Wawa down? Yeah, I'm pretty good at the Wawa. Okay, good. But, you know, I say that and I never use it anymore. Like really? it's weird. Like like there was like one year in L.A. Guns. I swear to God, on tour, every solo I use a Wawa pedal. <laughs> it was because it was the kind of thing, and, and you might be able to relate to it, where you get so good at something that it becomes part of your style. You know, I mean, kind of, I guess like Kurt Hammett in a way, like, like at some point, everything's a Wawa. Like, it just felt so good to play things with a Wawa that that's all I did. And then I guess the tour ended. And then whatever the next tour was or whatever I did next, you know, my Wawa pedal's always there. I don't think I've stepped on my Wawa pedal live in 15, 20 years. Oh, shit. Okay. It's weird, but but what, what you're saying is is really accurate um within the scene is guys going watching seeing what everybody's doing um and slash and i when we were younger our whole thing was try not to be like your friends you know try not to 
play anything like, you know, this guy. Like we had a couple other guys grow up with us, a guy named Marlon and a guy named Philip Davidson. And they were both Strat players. And Philip Davidson was like a real deep purple Richie Blackmore kind of guy. And then Marlon, he was like a Frank Zappa guy. And then I was kind of like this Page guy. And then Slash was like this Joe Perry guy. <clears throat> and so, you know, the discussion was always, this is my shit. You know what I mean? And like, oh, that's mm -hmm. your shit. And like, oh, you're great at your shit. And that way it kind of kept us from all having the same unique goal. You know what I mean? Like, like we weren't like all trying to be Eddie Van Halen, you know? Um, and so no it could be at that point, but you're that, right. That, that's right. That's right. You know, once Eddie was there, it was like, like, Oh fuck, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like ignore the monster. You know what I mean? Like, you know, Rick Darren did for life, you know, kind of thing. Um, so when I would go see slash play, you know, I would go and enjoy it. You know what I mean? I didn't think like, Oh, you know, what's he doing? Because I mean, you know, I saw him play almost constantly in my teenage years. So yeah. he was just great at being slash. Marlon was great at being Marlon. Philip was great at being Philip. And me, I was always trying to combine, you know, Johnny Thunders and Randy Rhodes and then with Jimmy Page in there somewhere, you know, so very definite um, thing. And it wasn't, I don't think any of us guys was really affected by what anybody else was doing other than, us going and enjoying things. So, you know, uh, like when John Frusciani joined the Chili Peppers, I really made an effort to become friends with him, you know, because I really yeah. respected his, his style, you know, he, cause you know, he was a GIT guy and I believe he took I lessons. I did not know that. I yeah. I completely did not know that. So he was like this real guy that That's knew everything. Player. Yeah. But his, his understated personality really was interesting to me. You know, this like minimalistic bionic approach because, you know, the record, the first record that he did, Mother's Milk, sound one way. Then you go see him live and he was a terror. You know I mean? It's like, Wah! you know, the, the whole Hendrix thing, you know? And, you know, so for me, again, it's like for me to be really interested in what the guitar player is doing, I had to know the songs already. Right. You know what I mean? And that was the thing because like, like we'll get to this later, I'm sure, but like the baked potato and all those kind of things that we did, um, it was interesting and fun and everybody was great and it was a good time. But unless Teddy called out a song that I was familiar with, I would just be bored. Even if I was playing, I'd be bored. I'd be like, I don't know this song, but I'm playing it. You know, and I think that comes from, which we haven't talked about yet really is queen and cheap trick, you know, yep. which are. I, yeah. Right. I was just, I was just going to say, those are two huge influences and me growing up. I think it's very cool that you guys had your, you know, you had your separate guys. I think it's a very cool approach. Like, you know, Slash was the Joe Perry guy, you know, right. you, you had your idol and, and then you kind of stayed in your lanes with that. I, th the guy that I was trying to be up in California and up in Northern California was uh, Rick Nielsen That's or, right. Neil, or is some sort of cross between Nick, uh, Rick Nielsen and Neil Giraldo. Cause those Perfect. early Pat Benatar records yeah. to me were, were great. And then this guy, Steve Stevens comes out from right. New York. Who's just like, makes this out with, with, and Billy Idol's kind of punk rock, but he's got this rock and roll guitar. Right. Him right. And he's got the fucking hair. Yeah. He's got this fucking hair that, that goes even bigger than whatever the biggest I could ever make my hair. <laughs> Stevens is a little bit bigger. <laughs> And I'm like, shit. So, and then I also had, you know, a, a Joe Satriani to, to go open for in a, you know, in clubs up North. Cause he was in a, a pop band called the squares at that point. Okay. So the, I mean, like his whole style to me, he encompassed everything that was blues shredding and this band called the squares had great songs. So, um, was Mike yeah, Varney I mean, involved with this, with squares? Mike Varney had his finger in everything at that right, point, okay. I believe, you know, I, I really do. But uh, yeah, my, I'm not sure if Mike, Mike Varney was a little bit more on the heavier side because he had shrapnel. So right. the squares were just like a power pop. Imagine if the police 
and Van Halen fucked and had wow. this beautiful child, you know, that was the squares. And awesome. that's, you know, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you some stuff about him. We've had Joe on the show before and he's talked about the squares and, um, you know, you've always had sort of a, um, a pop sort of sensibility as well. And that comes from, you know, the songs, right? Well, it's definitely, you know, I can definitely get lost in Pink Floyd, you know, and, and I often do. Um, but even at the end of the day with Pink Floyd, the songs are excellent. But what I really always noticed was that like, even from a, a young age, even if I didn't like the Stones that much yet, when I was younger, that I could always sing the songs if they came on the radio. You know, I was like, I was like oh, I know this song. I know this song. I know this song. So even when I first started writing, when I was before I was even 10 years old, it was like, I want to write a song that someone will hear and be able to sing along with it. And I couldn't sing, you know. You wrote so, songs before you were 10 years old? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, I started playing when I was six, you know, me and this little – yeah, you know, I'm mean, a little guy. You have the you little know. Bjorn Borg headband on yeah. and everything, man. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> oh, man, amazing. Were you but endorsed I, with that company right there? Hold on. I was. They came to me, you know, with a with a contract and a blank check and said, <laughs> you know, little Tracy Ulrich, please, you know. But um, Tracy Richard Irving Ulrich. See, Tracy, I do actually, that. it's Tracy Irving Richard Ulrich. It's always backwards. And that's why there's two I's in my name because – you you take Irving, use the initial, and pop it on to that Y, and it turns into two eyes, and it's Tracy Richard Ulrich. I just thought you wanted to differentiate yourself from Tracy Lords. I always thought that was the reason. You wanted just a little bit. Just one more I. One more I. The extra I yeah. is for extra, I don't know. She's so awesome. <laughs> she is, I right? Know. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I know that. So we so often get mistaken in text, right? Like, So like you get somebody... text from Tracy Lords? Yeah, but, but what I mean is like if someone's writing an article about Tracy Lords, they'll Tracy Guns. Or if someone's writing a guitar piece and it says Tracy Guns, Tracy Guns, then all of a sudden, like in one line, it'll say Tracy Lords because somehow it's just it's, in the it universe. interchangeable. Tracy Lords sounds like a guitar it, fucking shredder. You yeah. know, doesn't it? Tracy oh. Lords. She's, yeah. what, she's a lord or he's a lord. It doesn't matter. The name is like, it's a, he's a lord guitar player. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, so they are kind of interchangeable. But yes, I, mine goes one eye louder. It's one eye, isn't it? One, one more. <laughs> I always thought it was. And I don't know if you know this, but on my first, uh, well, not Dad's Porno Mag, but my second sort of Roxy 77, first Roxy 77 album, uh -huh. I put a song on called Tracy. And a lot of people have asked me, is that Tracy Guns? And I said, no, if you listen to the lyrics and you read the lyrics, you'll you'll really quickly understand that it's 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 about Tracy Lords. So I, you know, I don't know if you ever Does she know that? that she doesn't know that, but we haven't had her on the podcast yet. Vic, have you booked her yet? Vic's shaking his head no. You we know. can get Tracy on here. Definitely. She would love she's to. She's a musician and she's had a yeah. he's had a, a great career too. And she, you know what? She likes a lot of the punk rock type of bands. I think she played on um she actually appeared on what was that band that she played from the UK? Uh, great know. song. Okay, you don't know. But she but she yeah, I mean she's just down. She's super cool. You know, so, so you Atlanta. knew her. Did you know her from the LA days? Like by, by no, no. Um we, I don't think I've ever met her in person. I met her on Twitter, of all places. and Because you, you know, got mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. I, I don't know. But, you know, she's – and I think Ace Von Johnson, I think he knows her in person. Okay. You know, but, uh, you know, just – Ace you know, Von Johnson, uh, band member number 43, I think. He, of he's him. probably number 50, really. He's the last <laughs> yeah. guy to join. Oh, he was. Okay, so he's up there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, hey, check it out. We're we're halfway through. I mean, we're not even halfway through. I I, I have a feeling that we're gonna have to do a two part on this because I love talking to you, Tracy. I hope you like talking to everybody that's been in the trenches right now. Uh, oh, but we're great. gonna have a we're gonna have a really quick break. Um, I think we're gonna run the uh, Hughes and Kentner ad, and then we're gonna get into some of the equipment that you're using these days. Okay. Uh, this is the equipment that I'm using. So, Vic, if you can run that uh, Hughes and Kentner ad right now, we'll be right back with part two with Tracy Guns. 
Hello. Hello, Ryan Roxy here. And I get a lot of questions lately regarding the current guitar amp setup that I'm using. Well, here's the answer. It's the Hughes and Kettner Black Spirit 200 floor model. Because it's roughly the same size as a compact pedal board, it can fit on any stage or desktop easily. But don't let the size fool you. Inside is packed with a 200 watt power amp, a ton of presets and programming options, built-in Redbox Direct technology, plus all the built-in effects you'd want. And the secret behind the tone? Well, that's the Bionic Spirit Tone Generator, which is fully programmable on the amp by using its built-in Bluetooth to connect to the app, which works seamlessly with both iPad and Android devices. But probably the best thing about the Black Spirit 200 is that it's easy to use. With its user-friendly setup, I managed to get a great tone going within just a couple of minutes of plugging in. If you're looking for that perfect, compact, all-around amp that covers you in the studio, on the stage, and even live streaming, this is the one. Check out the links for the Hughes and Kentner Black Spirit below or in the description, and let's get rolling. Speaking of rolling, on with the show. There you go. Hey, I'm watching my son in Denmark watching me and you oh that's cool tell him he said hey D does he play his hip does he play himself my little guy the the, the no, 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 no. obviously he's like Jagger, 14 Jagger doesn't care about music my older son he has okay. a completely different brain like you know he's super school guy you know looks like a rock star doesn't care you know the whole thing but little <laughs> Oli, he immediately it's the first time he saw a guitar, bling, 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 piano, put music on, and he's just like, doo, 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 doo. so the the little guy, he's the music one. I love it. Well, you know what? My son started out with piano, and then now he's gone on to economics. So we'll see. There, what there you go. There. <laughs> but anyway, we are hanging out with Tracy Gunn, guitarist of LA Guns the new band sun bomb so much more and um yeah we're we're gonna get, getting to this place called the main event and the main event and we're gonna get into a little bit of equipment but the main event is about what you are currently up to right now because we do want people to to sort of uh support and uh check out what you're up to and from what i could see uh the newest album sun bomb evil and divine Mm -hmm. when is it's a collaboration with yeah. uh, michael sweet and i want you to talk about sun bomb and uh is this the first album that you have out or is this the second album what is this, is this is no this is uh it started out you know uh la guns is on frontiers records and um they hit me up and said hey do you want to do a solo record you know kind of like could have been an instrumental could have been anything and i'm like i don't know you know let me see what i can write you know and uh, so I wrote all this really heavy, 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 heavy stuff. And I thought to myself, who do I know that could sing this and make it real legit metal, you know? And and I just met Michael Sweet like an ear, a year earlier, an ear a year earlier. Um, Striper. Yeah, from Striper. Yeah, right there. And uh, I really liked him. And I know that he has those kind of pipes, you know, like real you know, D.O. Gillen kind of kind of thing. And that's where this music was headed. I needed that power, you know, and that that ability to to go really high. And I, I just sent him a text, hey, Michael, man, let me send you a song. You know, I sent him a song. He goes, what is this? I go, this is this, this thing I'm working on. Do you want to sing on it? And he's like, yeah, I want to sing on it. And I go, yeah, but you have to sing on the whole album. And he's like... <laughs> Oh really? If you sing oh, yeah. on this one, you got to sing on nine more. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And he did. And you know, it was the kind of thing where, at the time, I think I had four. I had to round the album out, and so that took some time. I started working on that in 2018, and it just got completed about six months ago. I'm going to say, you know, with the vocal and everything, because you know the pandemic and you know, wow. Um, so it finally got done. And um, it, it's actually not out till May 14th, the record, but it's gnarly. You know, we're not going to do any live shows or anything. It's just. Have you really, you've released some singles though? Two singles. Yeah. Okay, cool. And they can check them out. Where's the easiest place to check them out? I guess on YouTube, you know, that's where singles come out these days, you know? 
It is true, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's our. It's sort of our MTV. Ricky Rackman is now on YouTube. Is that what he's doing with the ball? He, he should be. I mean, the thing is, if he's not, because I know that he just started up the ball again. And we're talking, yeah. folks, about Ricky Rackman from uh, the infamous uh, or the famous, the world famous Cat House with uh, Tammy Ricky Down. And Ricky. Now, back, do you remember back in those days, those cat house days, um, or do you not remember? Because there's a, there's a picture of Gilby and Tracy, and there's Ricky right there having mm -hmm. one of his uh, rockabilly moments. But damn, they they were blurry, hazy, but a lot of fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's all that needs to be said on that. We're going to close the book on the cat house with that. And, and we're going to have Rick, Ricky hasn't been on the podcast yet. We'll get him on again. Uh, or we'll get him on at one point. Maybe Ricky and Tracy. Hey, that was a time. That was a time, man. Wow, that was a time. You know, just do you have, do you have a proudest moment at uh, Cat House? Oh shit! Or 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 a shamest moment? <laughs> the most the most shame or the most proud you've ever been at the Cat House? You have one. I, one I mean, I don't know, man. <laughs> we, we look. We were in our twenties. Yeah, I'll tell. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you my most proud yeah, moment of the tell, cat house. Tell me your, your... The most proud moment I ever had of the of the cat house was you know that there was a huge line in front of the the club every single Tuesday night. It was a two yeah. just in the trenches. I just maybe that's the reason why in the trenches on Tuesday. It was very yeah. trench trench like. It was trench like huge line out in front and i just sort of weaseled my way and squirmed my way through the crowd and big john the door guy saw me and i and big john and i loved each other he's he's always been a great guy and he just picked me out and said you come here and i i walked through and as i was walking through this guy goes fuck you and i looked up and it was mickey rourke i cut mickey rourke in line at the cat house <laughs> And that was my proudest moment of the cat house. So and it, as, I, as it should be, you know, because the, the greatest thing about the cat house was that like, yeah, all these, you know, kind of snooty Hollywood B actors always wanted like this kind of preferential treatment there, but it was our place. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, we wanted to hang out with those guys and, and do their free drugs or whatever they were doing. <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, Ryan Roxy came first, you know, Gilby Clark came first, Tammy came first, Nikki Six came first, you know, Slash came first. It was our clubhouse. And, you know, the only thing that 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 was just weird, and I think you kind of experienced the same thing then, is that, you know, there's just a lot of people touching us. You know, and I'm kind of weird about that. Like, you know, like I hug my friends. Like, you know, I'm into that. Like, you know, you're my friend. You're a hugger. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. But, but at that point in time, you know, like if a girl with big hair came up to you and was smoking and you smell that hairspray and the smoke and the alcohol. That Aquanet. Yeah. Yeah. And they they get close to you to talk to you. It's just like, oh, oh. you know, like, like, like I just... That's all I really remember back then is like running away from women. You know, you were terrorized by some girl with way too much Aquanet and probably fishnets on at one point. She broke a bottle over my head. Is that what happened? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, not a proud moment. That, no. uh, but you know, bottles yeah. do break. Do you do you remember it more on uh, La Cienega or do you remember the Highland location? What do you? You remember the Highland? I mean, I did, I did both, but but Highland was like that, you know, the real, you know, that was like weird and awesome. And the Highland location of Cat House is where I cut. Well, you know, I mean, I've never done drugs, so it was like for me, it was like just watching, you know, everybody just get so annihilated, you know, like every Tuesday that then it turned into bordello on Thursday, and then you know what I mean, like it just kind of like this thing. So it's like, I was kind of just witnessing like this weird metamorphosis of teenagers into adults, into drug addicts. And then you saw the whole thing from an outsider's perspective. Almost. You know what I mean? Because I just wasn't part of that. And I was really serious about music. So it was like getting LA guns footing, you know, and then leaving 
you know, so it was weird, you know, like once we were on our first tour coming back to LA and getting together with Ricky and Tammy and seeing the people that were still around, it started becoming strange, you know, because it was like, but maybe that's why your your progress of a guitar as a guitar player, just, just really skyrocketed as soon as you started making albums and stuff like that, because I mean, this is, this is news to me folks. And it's, it's great. Cause I didn't know about that. And, you know, I'm, really actually blown away and happy about the Tracy guns, never done drugs. Ryan Roxy never had tattoos. I there you can't go. Say the same thing about what Tracy hasn't done. And Tracy definitely can't say that he doesn't have any tattoos. Right. So That's there you true. go. So That's we true. can, but we've both done things never that, that, that would be status quo. Yeah. 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 Like we, I, I never did anything that was out of the ordinary, you know, I mean, um, gotcha. given, the kind of the culture we were living in. Oh, the culture we were living, what was really ordinary. Like you said earlier, before when we started the damn podcast, you go, no rules. And I go, all right, well, we'll talk yeah. about everything then. We're going to yeah. talk about all the things. But it's not up for me to talk now because we are heading to a point of the show where it's let the people speak. This is where uh, people that have actually put in, submitted questions for you and they want to find out about you, more about, about you. So it's now in the trenches time for let the people speak Hallelujah. yeah there you go our first question at brad massey what is your warm-up routine ah yeah yeah do you have do you want to get the guitar out it's no problem if you do i'll get mine out i'm not going to turn one of these on but i i can show you so the warm-up routine Look at this Les Paul brother. I have a Les Paul out right now too. There you go. There you go. There you go. And what it is, is it's, and this is a lesson I give to every one of my students about three or four lessons in after I figure out where they're at. And this is basically for accuracy and connecting your brain to your right hand, to your left hand, to the neck and playing good. It's a pentatonic scale and it's just, and you use your wrist to pick. You don't use your whole arm. You use your wrist and you just go up and down. You got the box, the box pentatonic. I like that. That's it, right? And But you start here. Start on an F. And you I'm go. Going up half steps. And you just go half steps and you do it once. And then you get into your lesson or your learning or your show or your stuff. Because it, it actually helps out both hands. It helps your mind connect to the guitar. I, I get it. I, I, I mean, and I'm so glad you play that box pentatonic because a lot of people go, oh, well, wait, I want to be able to find out how to uh, go diagonally. And they go, oh, yeah, that'll come. Th those types of scales will come where you can go more diagonal on the neck. But you know what? If you can come up with such amazing little riffs, two note riffs, two string riffs, whatever you can with that box sort of pentatonic scale you can come up with anything that's right i mean you know um my theory is depending on what you're playing against is that the extra two notes that make the scales minor or major can be very annoying so you know if you can map out your pentatonics first across the whole board which they exist octave to octave you know one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five there's modes of pentatonic right there are. I mean, you know, it's funny how I approach modes because my my feeling, my emotion is always a minor scale. That's I mean, that's what it's called. Um, so I make modes within the minor scale, which are all modes in the major scale, but they're relative to each other. And it's really confusing musically. But yes, um, mode means mood in Greek. And all it means is starting like a riff or a melody on any note other than the tonic and ending on the same note. That's not the tonic. So if that makes any sense to anybody, that's how you no, play. Any note you know, that's not, if it's in the key of D don't start this. Don't start the riff on the key. of. Don't start it on a D. Right. Right. So, you know, I love it. and some of them are very cool and some of them are really useless. <laughs> 
Well, I guess they'll have to find out more about your teaching methods and all that kind of stuff as well. I have a System 12 guitar method. Do you have your own method out these days? No. Okay. So because we every, every student I have is really looking for something different or they're at a different level right. or, you know, because to me, the guitar is like your voice, right? And, you know, and you want to speak to people what's going on in your head with this. So I try to get to know my students over a couple of weeks and see what they're trying to say. And every approach is different, you know, for me. Are you, are you teaching now um, primarily in, obviously you, you need to teach in Europe more than you do in the States? Here, it's just on Zoom. So, you know, they people sign up, log yes. on. Yeah, well, we're going to get to all your, your, um, we're going to get to all your socials and all your, the way that people can get in touch with you in just a little bit. Let's move on with another question at kiss fan PG. Do you like the band kiss? I do. And there's different eras and reasons. And, you know, I'm not an obsessed kiss fan. Um, but creatures of the night, there are early kiss songs that really get me going. And my wife and I have this, title thing you know this title it's like spotify okay oh yeah i didn't t t title yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it kind of can make these playlists for you that randomly pick music and on one of our playlists there's some old kiss stuff and the more it comes on the more i dig it <laughs> you know what i mean right, I'm, like, right. I'm like damn that that's really good. You know what I mean? Like, especially from a songwriting point of view, you know, great songwriting, to, great songwriting perspective. Uh, I've always said that Paul Stanley is such an anchor in that band with his rhythm playing. It's very underrated, his rhythm guitar playing, you yeah. know, and what he does and what he brings to the table. And the album, A Love Gun, for me, was the one that was my sort of, you know, uh, yeah, that makes my, sense. I mean, my sort of news of the world, if you will, and my sort of sure. heaven tonight. Sure. You know. And, and you know, the, Paul is a fantastic guitar player. Like, like he's a real, you know, he's up there, you know, I mean, he's not a, he's a front man. So he doesn't put his guitar first, you know, he doesn't make himself out to be this kind of guitar hero guy, but he, he could be, if he wanted to be, if he, if, right. if he wanted to join, I don't know, the Black Crows, for example, you could, do you could play all that stuff and, right. and, and be convincing and awesome. The thing about Love Gun and the three albums I just mentioned, Love Gun, News of the World and Heaven Tonight. Wow. They all, they all sort of came out right in that 77, 78 era. What a great time, man. Yeah, good music. Good music. Think it, speaking of, I'm moving on to At Master Vinyls has a question. Your top three favorite albums? It's impossible, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't mean, don't you have some go to? Don't you have a go to that you have? It's well, I be mean, Zeppelin 2 and Physical Graffiti, you know, I mean, those are my, I couldn't live without those two albums. But then how do you make that third one? Is it Blizzard of Oz? Is it Alice Cooper, Love It to Death? Is it, you, you, you know, it, it's, it's too, it's too much. And then, then there's a whole other genres of music I love, you know that that like garage rock like this is you know shocking blue has this song called uh send me a postcard it's like my favorite song of all time you know yeah, there so be some great songs out of those yeah, out of, on those albums yeah it's so difficult and you know my wife's really into like sisters of mercy and stuff like that and so i've really gotten into that stuff and it's like so that's more fresh for me right now so i'm kind of i like it more because it's fresher right. um it's so difficult um but I would definitely say, you know, if I had to have something, it would have to be the whole Zeppelin thing, the first four Van Halen records, and probably the three Randy Rhodes records, I guess. I don't know. Because Live at Budokan, Heaven Tonight. I don't know. There you go. You, you've named three different genres that are all sort of very respectable. But yeah. The, it's closing, because I never really closed the book on the theremin and how you learned it. Did you learn it? Did you study those albums or how did you take learning that? Cause when I saw the first time I saw you, I was like, shit, he's really good at this. He knows how to, 
you, you've worked it out. It wasn't just like, you know, you got a talk box and just went, wah, right. Wah, 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 right, right. You, know, you actually studied it. And how did it, how did you do that? Well, it was interesting because um, I used to go to Westwood in the middle of the night. You could take the bus to Westwood to see the Hendrix movie and the Zeppelin movie when I was like 12. And but the problem was, is that the bus didn't run when the movie was over. So it was very, I, I knew I had to walk four miles home, you know, afterwards. So when I would go and, and watch, I was really into the Zeppelin movie. I would really watch Paige play the theremin in a whole lot of love, you know, and I was like, like, man, what's he doing exactly? You know? And then I, I recognized the echoplex on top of his amp. And I knew that it was a there. I don't know why I knew it was called a theremin though. I have no idea. But anyways, by the time um, I was in 10th grade, my first class in my homeroom was electronic shop. And the first thing I ever made was a theremin. Um, oh, yeah. You know, so I couldn't learn to play it until I built one. You couldn't just go buy a sonic wave theremin because they were only made in 1962 and 1963 so there wasn't like you know hey i'm gonna go to guitar center and buy a theremin you know it, it wasn't Morley a thing. didn't make one there, there, there was only one company that made a talk box at that point so most people made yeah, the yeah i got a bunch of those yeah okay. yeah i blame them for my dentistry bills man those damn <laughs> they knock out the back of mowers huh Shit. i don't even want to talk about yeah. All right. But the theremin I'm problems with mowers too. Are you having mower problems these days? Oh, I mean, 15, 20 years, they started breaking from the, that. And then they just, it's a nightmare. Yeah. Um, and so, oh, anyway, so the theremin got, had we to build. We come theremin. here to talk about your, your dental work. We came here to talk about guitars and theremin, That's right. obviously. <laughs> um, Okay, so the next thing was a delay, right? Like, you know, if I, I knew that Jimmy Page had the Echoplex. Right. So I built the theremin. It kind of worked. It wasn't amazing, but it, it worked. And um, I found an Echoplex. You know, I'm like 13. No, 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 I was 16. I, I was a little bit older. I was in high school. Found an Echoplex for 200 bucks that barely worked. You know? It had an old tape in it. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I still use those goddamn things. Um, so yeah, you, you hook up the theremin into the Echoplex into your amp. But what I wanted to do is I wanted it to be stereo. And that's the thing that Paige couldn't really do live yet. You know, there was no way to send one signal here. I mean, I guess I could have, but he didn't. And I found a DD3 stereo delay. And I ran the theremin through that and it had its own dedicated two amps. So you'd have the and you that's very impressive, you know. Yeah, you this. mastered that shit. That's the reason why it's it, it. You you took some time into it. The fact that yeah. you built your own now, I I, I realize I'm not even going to touch that. You know. Well, it's yeah. crazy because like I see sometimes, you know, I see guys now, you know, that have a theremin, you know, stuff like that. They don't have a delay or anything, and they just go, <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. okay, yeah, you know, and it's like. I don't want. I mean, I am such a fucking snob sometimes, you know. And, and I hate. You're a theremin I hate, snob. You're a total yeah. theremin snob. I've never seen this side of Tracy Guns. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, and the reason it is is because all you have to do is take the extra five minutes to go on YouTube and see the capabilities of a theremin, yes. and then you can do more with the theremin. It, it's not just woo. <laughs> you know, it's like. It's a All thing. Right, it's, it's, a, it's a magic trick, you know. You got to learn the magic trick. Guitar and theremin lessons taught by Tracy Guns. Uh, we'll we'll get to the links in just a second, folks. But we're moving on now because I'm going to give you another impossible question. Okay. Oh, I love this. Well, I'm not going to. At Chuck Morrison is. At Chuck Morrison zero nine asks, you can form a band with a singer, a drummer, and a bass player you've never played with, which is. Almost an impossible question because you've played yeah. with a lot of <laughs> fucking singers, drummers, and bass players over the years. Uh, who do you pick for that group? Man, I'm going to get so much shit for the drummer because John Bonham is my favorite drummer, but I would want to play with Mitch Mitchell as the drummer because go. Mitch, um, 
he's somewhere between Keith Moon and John Bonham to me. You know, he's busier and he's he's busier than Bonham, but definitely has more is more solid than Keith Moon, you know. So that would be my starting point. Um people I haven't played with. So then it would have to be it would have to be John Paul Jones on bass. It just it has to be because he can write, he can arrange, he's a genius, you know. He, keyboards too. Like he yeah, I mean it's just like he's the band in a box, right? So he's, you got he's your secret oh, weapon right there. Okay, John Paul Jones. That's right. Now. That's right. That, I mean if, if, use- so so if he's good enough for page to be the secret weapon well he's yeah. obviously the guy right? right so uh and he could be interchanged with teddy andreatis so yeah, yeah. well okay do you take john paul jones and his bass player sort of you know because he does play keyboards as well like teddy and but he you know he does play this other instrument called the bass i guess john paul i guess you could say he <laughs> plays bass right yeah. but teddy plays the sampler see that's the thing would you would you is it really worth that? You know, you yeah. give up. The John Paul, or? I love you, but Teddy goes, boy, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> where are the white women at? That's yeah, the whole thing. But yeah, but I have played with Teddy, so he doesn't count. Um, All right, that, that's right. So, so it is John Paul Jones. And then you have to, do you have to ch- decide on a singer for this band? Chuck Morrison, you are messing with Tracy Gunn's head. Well, um, It would be Elvis Presley. Damn. Look at that. That could be the perfect band. Mitch Mitchell, Elvis, John because- Paul Jones, Elvis Presley, and Tracy Guns. I have no idea what the fuck it would sound like, but I think damn. you do. I think you do. I mean, I think I think you could you could imagine it. I think it would it, you know, it would be the music would be exciting, it would be up more up tempo. And um Elvis's hips would be going nuts and he'd be driving the ladies crazy. And it would have to be black leather Elvis because oh, yeah. be your black leather. So oh yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I mean, it'd have to be the, it'd be Honolulu. Vegas. No, you know, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. What are those things called? No. Uh, lava flows. What are those drinks they have? In Hawaii? Whatever. That would be to me the perfect band for me. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, there you go, Chuck Morrison. I hope you're happy. You've just created the perfect band that <laughs> might not happen on this planet, but it will no, happen. It, no. it might happen someday. You never Good. know. At Mark Weiss uh, asks, touring plans for Sunbomb? None. Okay. That's a quick answer. <laughs> I mean, it's so, look. I'm throwing Sunbomb a bone. Here I am. No, 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 no. The music speaks for itself. You know, people, they like it. It's going to do fine. And, okay. but it's the type of thing, you know, I have two children that live 5,500 miles apart from each other. I have two homes. Um, I have to tour with LA Guns to some extent. You know, we have a record coming out in November and we have a live record coming out in July, you know, so it's like I have to really be careful with my time. You know, I'm You're 55 busy, years old, I live in two places and my children come first. You know, they, they, they just do period. Crazy guns, man. You're saying all the right things, all the right answers. Damn it. All right. I'm going to try and stump you. At Gorick, or I'm not going to try and stump you. At Gorick is, at Gorick in 1985, your favorite LA Guns guitar solo. Do you have one? Um, well, this the one that's out <clears throat> is on, um, I can't even tell you the name of the song. Hold on. But you love the damn solo. I can tell you that much. Yeah, yeah. It's just Vic because has a clip uh, of it, by the way. I, I'm whatever you're gonna say. Vic has a clip of it. Okay, well, let, me, let me see here. Uh, the album is called "The Devil You Know," and I think it's called "Another Season in Hell." It's called "Another Season in Hell." The Devil, the Devil You Know is just not the song that you know. You think yeah, no, the song is called Another Season in Hell. Another Season in Hell, that's Tracy Gunn's favorite guitar so that, solo. That's my my you know current favorite. I think it's the 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 best feel, you know, it's like the 
the it speaks but there's one on the new record um and what song is it the working title for the song was murder ballad if that gives you any clue to this, this one but uh it's on the new record and it and the song is called um if it's if it's over now and it won't be out till november anyways but that's the best solo i've ever recorded and written and structured and phrased and and made that's myself right. cry and all that crap well there, there you go we'll look forward to that and that's our exclusive right now i like the fact that you know i've heard you say in interviews before that when you write a solo it's like telling a story and that's what i tell uh, people that uh, learn guitar from me as well and take my advice whatever it is. Um, yeah. You say you got to make a guitar solo, not sound like a scale, but make it sound like a story that helps out the song that complements the song. Right. That's right. That's right. You know, and as, as crazy as this sounds, <clears throat> you know, I, I heard, um, I was in the truck yesterday. And I think it was ain't talking about love by Van Halen, you know, the solo is so simple and it's so powerful. You can sing it. You just sing it. You just, I just sang did. The solo. Yeah. You know, that's how important the song is. You know, that when it comes to the solo, don't ruin the song with the solo. <laughs> <laughs> you, know what, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's yeah. like, you know, I think Vi, out of all the great guitar players in the world, when he, that first record he did with David Lee Roth, I think he was the best at ins inserting really fast, nimble soloing in songs, and it worked. They were exciting. They were melodic. And they fit the song, but I can't really think of anybody else. You know, I mean Eddie, obviously, but I mean you know Eddie, Eddie's Eddie. It's very cool that that you know, uh, Vi was able to make the guitar talk. He, yeah. it, 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 a lot of people, a lot of great guitar players can make the guitar sing, but he right. can actually make it talk. You know, he, in the be that beginning of Yankee Rose, the fucking guitar is talking. Back it is. David Lee Roth, and that's I, I definitely get that, you know. Vi is such a great human, you know, that it really it's like he has a certain innocence about him being such a student of the guitar that everything great he does is almost innocently, you know, he still will spend 40 hours working on a part, you know what I mean? Because he's innocent. He's like, I want to do something special, you know, and he does, you know, he's Pure. incredible, incredible. Pure guitarist. I love it. Well, Tracy, a couple more questions, and then I'm going to just talk a little bit about equipment, if that's okay with you. Yeah, uh, but at the Giuliani, at the Giuliani, why was Chuck Garrick forbidden to go shirtless when he was in L.A. Guns? He was always in L.A. Guns. <laughs> Okay, I thought I, I didn't know if it was a rumor or if it was Gianelli. What is it? Is, was he ever forbidden though? The, I think there the, the, the urban legend had it because I've actually heard this story from Chuck. Before, really? I think this is where he's getting it. He's getting that he was not allowed to go shirtless. He was not allowed. He was forbidden to go shirtless when you were on tour with Poison. Could that be possible? Because it wasn't from you. Interesting. But, yeah. Could that have happened? Interesting. Because I that does push a button in me. Um, hmm. But I don't think he ever wore a shirt though. You know, because so he just he just thumbed it. He just said, screw, you know. Well, I, I think it, it would have been like 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 a passing comment more than a rule. Like right. You know, and I and I know where that would have kept come from. Um, <laughs> you know who it would have come from. Yeah, uh, which is really funny to me. But uh, 
I'm pretty sure if you were able to find video of us on that tour, we're probably both Shuck shirtless. Be shirtless. Yeah, everyone's shirtless. Yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is, you know, if, if you are the support act for Poison and you have Chuck Eric in the band and Chuck Eric is shirtless, you can just pretty much count any sort of ladies being right. sticking around that long for your show because, you know, he's Chuck without a shirt on there it is and obviously vic i was giving i was throwing vic a softball to put a picture of chuck without a shirt on but too late you lost, <laughs> it, you lost it one last question and this is from a uh happy birthday of ours. Yeah, there you right. go a mutual friend of ours griff from the yes. london choir boys at griff 69 picks griff from the choir boys asks, have you heard of mick cripps band the brutalists I'm their biggest supporter, God damn it! What do you mean, Griff? <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. It's uh, that's our exclusive. Tracy Gunn financially supports but, Mick Cripps. <laughs> yeah. By the way, it's a again great songs. You know, if you get a chance to hear the Brutalists, uh, it's Nigel Mogg is on lead vocal. Kent Holmes plays lead guitar, or maybe Mick does. I don't know. Um, Nigel. Griff's from Griff's band, the or, or former bass player of the uh, Choir Boys. Boys. There yeah. it goes. Great band. Love it. Well, there you go, folks. We are wrapping up The People Speak. But now, it doesn't matter because it's gear geeks and equipment freaks. Vic, do you want to run the little uh, commercial that we have for... Oh, he's shaking his head now. We don't even have any animation for it. We should. We should have it because we're going to talk about your current gear. And I know that uh, both you and I, we showed them earlier, we're Les Paul guys, and uh, you are uh, Gibson and Kramer. I think Kramer uh, is one of those things. You have a guitar, a star guitar that came out. Um, do you have one of those lying around? At one right point? And, and tell this us all new, about it. My new signature model, right? What it's is called, this now? The Talk to us about this guitar. I feel like, you know what, Tracy? I feel like I'm at the Troubadour on a Tuesday night right now. This is, That's this is, right. is that a Maple Neck Kramer? What's the name of the model? Tell, it's tell us Tracy about. Gunn's Gunstar. Gunstar. Like because it. it's a gun and it's a star all in one. And it's got glitter paint. Wow. Look at that. It's got some good old fashioned GMP sort of glitter paint yeah. on it from the old it school does. days. And, and uh, it's got a set neck, and it's got uh, pro buckers, and it's got coil splits, so you can go single coil. And it's it got a, part of the Gibson family of brands, which that's I'm why. Very happy about. Yeah. So I'm proud to endorse Gibson Epiphone and Kramer. So wow. we made 500 of these, and they're almost gone. So if anybody's interested in one, you got to go on like Sweetwater or you know probably guitarcenter.com and you might be able to still get one they're only 900 bucks brand new love it looks good looks good well we were talking a little bit about those pickups a little bit before because you say you got the um you i saw you on the uh, the show a couple nights ago and you with pete and you were talking about your pickups and you said a paf you're a big yeah. fan of the paf yeah. now just real quick trivia you, you do know what paf stands for Patent applied for. Fucking, you're right on it, man. You are part of the Gibson family of brands. I had to, there, and, and who, who is that a picture of? I have no idea. I, I, I would say it would be Seth Lover. Yes, really? It was Seth, Seth Lover who invented the humbucker dirty. pickup in 1955. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that he was the inventor of the PAF. Okay. Yes, it's the, the patent applied for, and then it Seth just Lover. became, yeah. Okay. The humbucker because it bucked the hum. I it love did. it. And so it's still we, <laughs> we're getting over our pickup knowledge. We're going. I don't want to go down that fucking rabbit hole too long because I want to get up <laughs> to amps. All right, because you saw me on my commercial. I've been uh, getting into this floor model amp, the Houston uh, Kettner uh, nice. Black Spirit floor model, and I know that you have um, some floor models that you've been working with, plus yeah. VHT amps and head rush effects so are those your your main uh get that's my these days yeah that's that's been well the vht thing happened during the pandemic which really sucks but we i have played them live because we've done a couple live streams and um they're the d50 amps and they're it's like a dumble circuit 
they're gnarly and they're and in the clean channel they're super loud and and really an awesome sound but the way i run my rig is the head rush pedal board um that's where all my sounds come from so really and all your effects from that yeah and my amp sound so so what i what i do is i run into the effects returns of the vhts in stereo and that's my whole setup so it's either a gibson and epiphone or a kramer into the head rush into the vhts and then i also use head rush powered speakers in front of me so it's like surround sound and, and then who's gonna be happy rush, about that what's up you know who's going to be happy about that is uh, Head Rush, who's in the chat. I've seen them commenting in the chat the whole time. So thank oh, yeah. you, Head Rush, for showing oh, up in the chat. Family, man. That's this is family. This stuff. All right. Well, hopefully my Hughes and Kettner guys are all watching in the chat. If you are, yeah, and and of course together uh, with the Gibson, because I I just did a uh, a Gibson lesson on the Gibson app. Have you seen right. that Gibson app that's out there? So you'll get to pretty soon coming out will be some Alice Cooper songs taught with the Gibson app. There you go. There's your boy from Head. Hey, Rush. Brian. <laughs> so we do have some uh, animation now because this is a good one. This is called The One That Got Away. And <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have a chance. I didn't have a. Ch that was me this morning watching the, the uh, Wolfgang Van Halen video. Yeah, oh. this is so freaking good. You guys got to go out and watch that. But I didn't have a chance to set it up because Vic just ran the clip right when I said it. But you know, uh, this is the one where um, we ask you about a piece of gear that you wish you still had. And huh. How and why did you lose it? Sell it? Or basically, it went away. Well, I've had some. You wish you had it back. I've had some key guitars stolen that I wish I had back. But really, I think you know the, the first guitar, you know, substantial guitar I ever had was a '77 Les Paul Custom. Oh. I worked for for my dad, you know, for almost a year, and we went and bought it in 1978 from West LA Music on Hollywood Boulevard. And what happened was, you know, after putting in my time on that guitar, replacing the pickups with the Marzios, you know, doing the whole thing, um, I saw a picture of Eddie Van Halen with a Strat style guitar. And that's what I wanted. And I traded my the most badass Les Paul in history for this crappy Mighty Might, you know, with, with a cheap bridge on it. Yeah, it was the stupidest thing I ever. I'm sure I've done things equally as stupid since, but I really wish that I didn't do that. I'm the reverse, man. I had a strap. The first guitar that my parents ever got me, yeah. I'm sorry, Santa Claus ever got me, was a um, a off white cream strat, and I, and it was an amazing maple neck, all the silver bullet, the truss rod, everything. And the first time I heard, uh, I saw. A, Ibanez Destroyer, I think it was a maybe a Judas Priest or a cheap trick, some sort of video on Don Kirshner's. And I was like, oh, that's that that that's how you get that sound. It's heavy. You have to have a humbucker pickup. So I tr I immediately traded the Strat for an Ibanez. Yeah, uh, you know, we do things. We live. We learn. Yeah, I mean, but you know, we had no budget, so like that was our budget. It's like. Yeah. I want that here, <laughs> you know, like a 77 Les Paul custom probably weighed about as much as you did at that time. It did. <laughs> it did. It, and, it, and it was, it was nice. I think slash even talks about it in his book, you know, that I had come to school with the, you know, the shiny new Les Paul and, and the whole thing. It was a good, it was a great guitar and I really miss it. And, and the guy knew exactly what he was doing. It was this really weird guitar shop on Fairfax, de de like right next door to Molly Malone's, um, <clears throat> that was out of business shortly after I did that trade when I was about you know 16 or something, you know, whatever. 
Well, you know what? It's rumor has it, and I've always wanted. I don't know if you'll remember this, but uh, you are rumored to have owned one of my favorite guitars that I ever got after the the Strat. I, you know, the first real guitar I had for all the years of the Electric Angels, and then all the albums subsequent after that, all the Alice Cooper albums. Um, I still have it with me. It's a '72 uh, Les Paul uh, Gold Top. Uh, and it was a, and I bought it or I didn't buy it. I traded about nine or 10, you know, sort of ESP and off brand other, you know, really, I don't even know what kind of brand guitars for this Gibson Les Paul. Um, and it, it was the one that was supposed to have the mini humbuckers in it, but it Mm -hmm. had been routed out for DeMarzio's it's had, it was a gold top. And I don't know if you ever owned, one of those guitars, but sold it to Howie over at Guitars R Us because that's how I got it back in the, on Sunset. Back oh, in the day. yeah, I think I, I think I know your guitar you're talking about. Yeah, wow. yeah, I've I've had some a few different Frankenstein um, gold tops. Um, <clears throat> it's a deluxe, but yeah, it's, it's actually deluxe. route. It's routed out for a. For the humbuckers, and I still have it to this day. It's my '72. I call it my first girlfriend. Wow! Wow! Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know, I know that guitar, and then the lineage of that is that later I had a fifth, a real '54 Les Paul, which came with P90s that was routed for humbuckers. You know, instant devalue. <laughs> um, and we then, don't care. you know, and it's like at that point, we just want to sound heavier. That's right. <laughs> you want to sound like Rick Nielsen, man. And then, and then the other guitar I ruined was a, uh, uh, the other gold top was, uh, I wanted to make it, it was a big headstock. So I don't even know what years those are. It was a, uh, it was a deluxe, the big head. Bigger headstocks are the earlier '70s ones. It's like the, during the uh, what era was it called? Because because mine has all the wrong. Oh, oh uh, it has, it has a sandwich, it has a sandwich body. Um, I should Norlin. know. Huh? The Norlin era. Norlin, Norlin era. Yeah, the Norlin so this era. This was definitely a Norlin gold top, right? And it weighed so much. So what I want, what I had done to it, and I don't remember how, who I had to do it. I had it converted to a single humbucker, filled in the other cavity with a Floyd Rose on it, and had it painted like candy apple red. Chuck uh, Burns from Killing Machine, the drummer, I believe he still has that guitar. I love it. Well, I, I, would, I would say that the, there's a lot of equipment, you know, spread across the oh. Los Angeles area that you that that's, that's been, you know, under your lineage, if you will. <laughs> You, you know Rod Victor, right? Of course, yeah. Okay, so Rod would tell me because you know, you know, he was my drug dealer, right? Like, hey man, here, you know, <laughs> give me more drugs here. You my know. guitar dealer. <laughs> and he would always call me because people would come in, and like I would always have a big pile of shit for sale at Guitar Center, and people would always come in and go, "That's got to be Tracy Gunn's gear because my gear is always so filthy." You know, it's just like. <laughs> I never clean anything. I never wipe anything because there's something about, for me, especially my guitars, they just got to be soaked in my DNA. You know, it, it's just, it's just a weird mental thing. That but, is a bonus when you get a piece of Tracy Gunn's gear is that it yes. is soaked in your DNA, I guess. See? I guess you could look at it as a bonus. Uh, you could, you could, <laughs> you shouldn't, but you could. <laughs> Or some sort of crime scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, well, you know what, Trace? We're gonna have to have you on again when when you're yeah. back in my time zone, and yeah. we're, hopefully both of us are out there on the road again playing, yeah. because we've hit that point of the show where we're taking uh, taking care of business. We are heading out to the highway, and uh, we would not leave the show without uh, people finding out how to get in touch with you and the best way to get in touch with you. Cause what is your social media platforms of choice? We're going to put them up there right now. And if you can say them for the people listening on the audio prog- uh, podcast. Um, was it Instagram at Tracy guns, Facebook slash Tracy guns, 
Twitter at Tracy Guns. My website is Tracy.net. And remember, my name is spelled with two eyes, no nose, and no mouth. No, it's T-R-A-C-I-I. Um, if you want lessons, um, you send me a direct message at Instagram. So Instagram's and your, I your weapon time. of choice. Yeah. Yes, that's that's where I do my communicating. Or not. Right. It's, it's <laughs> been... Well, you've communicated a lot with us today, Tracy, and sure. I couldn't be happier that you've been in the trenches with us. Um, would you like to come back on another time at, again? Because I know our, our people are going to say, yeah, we want a part two and we'll talk. Yeah, I, didn't yeah. even, I didn't get a chance to talk about the other 98 bands. I, we, we briefly right. touched upon, you know, uh, Bride Destruction. Of course, we talked about L.A. Guns and the new band Sun Bomb. But I'm, I mean, there's so many things I want to talk about with Contraband, all of the course. albums, Gilby. You know, yeah. um, the, the Tracy Gun Guns League of Gentlemen. I don't even know what that is. That might. Oh, be awesome. Okay. I thought that was like a. a That's a my psychedelic recordings, man. <laughs> the Devil City Angels. Damn, the, the, the band, the list of bands go on and on and on. So um, we'll have you back on, yeah. Tracy. Does that sound good? Yeah. What I, I, I should be, in theory, I'll be back in Denmark on May 2nd, depending. I'm still waiting for a work permit thing. Um, and then I'll be there for six weeks. We try to spend six weeks here, six weeks there, but since the pandemic and with little Oli, he just turned 14 months yesterday. Um, he started daycare. Um, we're spending more time there right now in Denmark. So I'm just, did you get the vax yet? Did you get, I did. did. I, did. I got the shot James one and in. shot two. I just got the one and done the Johnson and Johnson. And it made me really sick for a couple of days and now I'm fine. Cool. Well, at least you got it, man. I see. The thing is, you're in because now we're kind of like, uh, we're I'm a Mara Swede. You're a what do you call a, a Danish? A Mara Danish? A uh, uh, Danish? Uh, Danglish. Danglish. That's what you are. You're Danglish. I'm a Mara Swede. I need to go there to get. How did the you get damn... this great? Are, are you? You're there permanently, right? Not permanently because. Um, I am now married to a gal from South Africa. And so eventually that's the next route, but the kids are still in high school. So it, yeah, it reads right. like, it reads a little bit like a James Bond film, you know? Movie. Yeah. It's, it's such a, a strange lot. We could talk about this part often. two. Let's do yeah, that. Okay. We'll, we'll do that. And uh, hang on for just one second while I say, uh, Hey, door. And how do you say goodbye? Have you learned how to speak a little bit of Danish? Do you say, hey, door? Yeah. What do you say? Back at the desk. All right. There you go. Okay. Until okay. next time. Hi. Hi. Be say snart. <laughs> we say snart. That's perfect. That's very Swedish and Danish. Um, yeah. So we shall, folks, everybody in the chat, you've been great with all your comments the whole entire time. Thank you very much. Uh, next Tuesday, actually next whole week, we have a week of hope. And we're talking about a week of Doug Stanhope because we uh, will have Doug Stanhope for part ones and part twos on next week's In the Trenches. But we have been experiencing uh, Tracy Guns. Uh, so many great stories and so many great things happened today on today's show. So you'll want to go back and check it out. Um, until next time, folks, thank you very much, Vic, for producing the show. And Tracy, again, thanks for taking the time. Good times, man. Thanks for everybody being on uh, the program in the chat. Until next time, I'm Ryan Roxy. Enjoy the ride. See you. Trenches with Ryan Roxy.